Hello, this is Five Mualam Ak of the Incarcerated Nation Network. I'm presenting to you a film titled Broken on All Sides. It's a film produced, written, and directed by Matthew Pillisher, who is a very good friend of ours and a comrade abolitionist. Um, and the film is dated back to 2010. It's when mass incarceration really was on a national level of being understood. But also, it's a great comparison now because we are 20 years from the date of that, 10 years from the date of that, and how much has changed in that decade. The stats are still the same. The police oppression is still the same. Um, the amount of police violence, prison and incarceration, the rate that youth are incarcerated are still the same. This documentary was very pinnacle because it was a short film, uh, feature length, that literally addressed most of the major issues and used Philadelphia as a microcosm of the macro of America. And so we still have 2.5 million people incarcerated and the youth and those who are young activists are still on the front line of making that change. Um, it's a great film. Uh, we're going to have several podcasts after this around mass incarceration and the structure of the prison industrial complex and different components. And I wanted to just present this film because it paved the way in nationally for other organizations to get involved, the National Lawyers Guild, um, the Quakers, a religious movement, a movement of people on a human rights level working with allies and activists and organizers. And so I present to you, Broken on All Sides, produced, written, and directed by Matthew Pellisher, and I will include the director's um, social media links and other articles and projects that he's a part of, also a board member of Incarcerated Nation, so I'm very proud of this film as well. It's going to be one of our cataloged items. We're going to be presenting and bringing you new documentaries and new films, as long as well as other films uh, from the past uh, so that you can have them as your access. During this time, we need to educate ourselves and organize, and these films help people learn. Broken All Sides. If you want to be safe in a city, if you want to be safe in your neighborhood, and Philadelphia is a beautiful, large, and vibrant city, then you better care about the justice system and about what goes in and out of the prison. We as a nation have become blind not so much to race, but to the existence of racial caste. We've become blind to the existence of a group of people who are locked into a second-class status and become indifferent to their suffering. We've got thousands of people in this city that need training, that need jobs, that need economic opportunity, that need housing, and that they need a sense of hope that many of them don't, ha don't have now. I would say people that, even if they don't have uh, people in the prison system, they should care just, I mean, in my own opinion, because it's only right. You know, like, they, they're human just like y'all are. So, what's the difference? It's very common to go to some neighborhoods and very hard to find a family that doesn't have somebody somewhere in the criminal justice system. Locked in prison, but they living in a big house to 
it's white, it's not right. We gotta fight. They don't lock up corporate criminals that ruin the planet. Jails filled with nonviolent offenders, and it's tragic. There's the rehabilitation or correction or direction. It's corruption. They got gangs. They can stop the way it's run. Them is coming out worse. They immerse the dysfunction. Gotta stop the profit and imprison get driven and change this. Yeah. Societal conditions causing inequality and robbery. Technology is something that's not distributed properly. It's packed with mostly blacks and Hispanics. It's riddled with a lot who got time that's innocent. I start innocent. to explain with the hurricane's pain. It's a shame. It's so much racism in the system. Opposite of heaven, Rockefeller drug laws is used as a weapon in deception of detention. I had to fight. I had to fight. I had to fight. For uh, almost 200 years, this country had a direct correlation between crime and, and prison populations. And the prison populations rose and fell just a little bit, but were generally uh, uh, the same. And then about 30 or so years ago, it just went off the charts. Uh, decisions were made to, to utilize incarceration to address social ills that had never been made before. Primarily the drug war, uh, criminalizing all kinds of uh, conduct that in, in the past had been subject to treatment, uh, mental illness, uh, drugs, alcohol, things of that nature. Uh, there was a decision made by both major political parties to, to use incarceration to address social ills and it caused a tremendous Uh, increase in prison populations. We have 5% of the world's population, yet we have 25% of the world's prison population. You know, it, we're building prisons rapidly, fast. And, 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 and each year, we're talking about every two, every two years, you know, they're overcrowded. So I'm saying that that's, that cannot be the answer. I mean, people just don't want to come to jail, I don't think. You know, I just don't buy that. But the whole concept is, is that if you put that much time in rehabilitation as you do put, in, put money in jails, you know, what difference would that make? So, so we, in the same scenario, that we just keep billing and more people come to jail. You know what I mean? And then you put them back on the street again, to another six months, to another year, they're back in the jail again. You know what I mean? So why is it recidivism? Sometimes crime goes down like it has in the recent past, although it's heading up again. Um, and criminologists love to debate why that is. And then there's wide disagreement. Um, I think people do agree that the economy plays an important role in the social picture and therefore in the use of criminal justice. Most prisoners are in prison for economic crimes or crimes that are related to economics. That's why. Well, once the average person understands the nature of this society, right, and if they call themselves people of conscience, people of spirituality, uh, forthright people, then they should understand the nature of this society and the victimization of the poor here. People in the brown and black community are being arrested more than any other um, group of people. Also, uh, Pennsylvania has increased the population within the last three years by 24%. And we are one of the third fastest growing prison department in the country. Pennsylvania is big. We're at the top of the list for this overcrowding. If you look at crime rates over the last 30 years, you see that uh, Property crimes went down just a tick. Violent crimes went up just a tick, but the prison populations have gone up over five, six hundred percent. So uh, there's not much correlation anymore to prison populations to crime rates. The use of confinement is responsive to what we do about crime. So if we are arresting everybody, there goes the population. In the 80s and 90s, the drug war and the drug epidemics happened, started as cocaine, then changed to crack cocaine, and now we're into very bad days. 
President Reagan declared, officially declared his drug war in 1982 at a time when drug crime was actually on the decline, not on the rise. It was about racial politics, not drug crime. But they got lucky. And a couple years after the drug war was declared, crack hit the streets. Uh, first in Los Angeles and later spread to communities of color across America. Today, there's a new epidemic, smokable cocaine otherwise known as crack. Uh, the Reagan administration seized on this development with glee actually hiring staff whose job it was to publicize inner city crack babies, crack dealers. I'm especially concerned about what drugs are doing to young mothers and their newborn children. The so-called crack whores and in efforts to build public support for a drug war it had already declared. Uh, in my opinion, we're better off from a public safety perspective to treat individuals with drug and alcohol problems and mental health issues than to incarcerate them. Generally, their time in prison is a waste, it's very costly, and they get out with the same issues that they went in. And plan worked like a charm. Almost overnight, our television sets were flooded with images of black and brown drug users and dealers and drug-related violence, and soon politicians across the political spectrum began competing with each other to prove who could be even tougher on them. Name's Nathaniel Gravely Hayes. I live in uh, North Philadelphia. Quiet neighborhood now. Used to be a little bit better before, but. Tell us where you work, Nate. I, I do construction with my father. Um, we actually doing jobs now, uh, renovating temple houses. So, yeah, I grew up around here. I was born at uh, MCP Hospital, mm -hmm. up uh, Henry Avenue. Been living right here just about my whole life. Uh, when I first started school, elementary, I started school at uh, uh, Thomas May Pierce. My daughter attends it now. What grade is your daughter in? She's in kindergarten. She just started. Who was your favorite teacher? Uh, Mr. Moore. What did he teach? He, uh, he was my second grade teacher. He, he was the best teacher I had. I, st I still be in connection with him now. Does he still teach there? Yeah. So your daughter might have them in a couple of years. Just about, yes. She's lucky. Yeah. People who are living in ghetto communities today, you know, experience tremendous frustration because not only are they being, you know, targeted in clearly biased ways by law enforcement, you know, in countless ways, um, they experience the discrimination and often brutality um, of our criminal justice system. And yet the people in those communities also desperately need law enforcement protection. They desperately need crime prevention. Um, and so they're caught, they're trapped. And this creates a dynamic in which, you know, police departments can say, well, those communities want us. They ask for us to come in um, and, you know, they want us to get tough um, on the violent offenders in their community and they want us and they need us. Look, they're, they're demanding more law enforcement protection. But the problem is, is that it's the only thing that people of color can ask for and get. Yo, he down, man. Good. I still stop. Stop fighting. I still stop. Yo, come up here, OG. They fucking have to get up, dog. 
Make your point, sir. I think we ought to be tough. I, I, like, I like the concept you liberals like to accuse me, we conservatives, of wanting hanging judges. I do. You do. I want tough, to tough laws. I want them to yeah. be enforced. I, I do a lot of different things. If you trace the origins of the get tough rhetoric, you can actually trace it all the way back to segregationists who were searching for colorblind rhetoric. Our streets are not safe. Immorality begins to flourish. Violence pits American against American. You know, once the civil rights movement began to gain steam and it no longer became acceptable to say segregation forever, and they were searching for a rhetoric that would appeal to poor and working class white voters, particularly in the South, who were threatened by and resentful of many of the gains of African Americans in the civil rights movement. Now, the civil rights movement really rocked the world um, of poor and working class white folks um, in the South. You know, wealthy whites could send their kids to private schools um, and give their kids all of the advantages that wealth has to offer. But poor and working class whites were faced with a social demotion um, and the advent of the civil rights movement. Um, it was their kids who were you know, going to be bussed across town um, to a school that they thought was inferior. Follow as your children are bussed across town. As president, I shall, within the law, turn back the absolute control of the public school systems to the people of the respective states. Well, pollsters and political strategists found that by using kind of these racially coded, you know, catchphrases, getting tough on crime and cracking down on welfare, getting tough on them. The other America, the other America is no longer a dream, but a nightmare. We don't want this. They could appeal to those voters um, as effectively, if not more so, as with the segregation forever and the explicitly racist rhetoric. You know, we now have today a system unparalleled anywhere else in the world that was born of racial divisions uh, in the wake of the civil rights movement. HRC has knocked on a couple of church doors to ask them, can we come in and educate your um, congregation in reference to what's going on in the prison? But what we're finding with the churches is that a lot of um, members of the church have a shame thing going on about admitting that they have a loved one in prison. My family wanted to visit me when I was incarcerated, but me and myself, I didn't want them to. Yeah. So I just told him to stay home, yeah. maintain your regular lives. I don't want to be a burden on nobody else. You know, my situations, my mistakes. Oh, man. 
What what I do want to say is that I'm glad um, that God has called uh, myself along with some of these other brothers that I see and I know and I love and I minister uh, with so well. Amen. We who were incarcerated together. Stop talking about them babies walking down the street. Oh, look. Copper. Thank you, God. Thank you, job I've ever had. I made good money at it. But I realized that God didn't call me to do that. Mm -hmm. After being in the two years, I noticed something wrong with this picture. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then I realized, too, once I got in church for it, I realized that it could be me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And when you when you understand what the word is about, and it shows you how quickly you can be judged and be quickened and locked up for the way. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and I look at the young people at the school, in the school system that I'm telling you that, that $650 million they're in debt to the system that they're in debt for as far as, um, as, far as finances. And if you drop out of school, well, your next stop is prison. You know, they're going to give you a PP number. They're going to give you a PP number now and, and actually lock you up. Because they've got a room to put you in. Mm -hmm. So they feel if they give you a PP number, they always got you under control. They always got you under check. So what we try to do is we try to humanize um, uh, the issue. We try and involve ourselves with the family members and prisoners. So we do forums, we do rallies, um, we conduct meetings and so on to try and build, you know, and show the humanity that exists um, even in a place like death row. You know, people who have been branded felons often, often deal with such shame and stigma that they try to pass. People labeled felons try to pass, not just by lying to employers or housing officials, but also by lying to friends, neighbors, and loved ones about their own criminal history or that of their loved ones. So then you have this dynamic going on that also builds into this very disenfranchised community or, uh, right, of people, and they feel shame, and they feel they have no outlet, they have absolutely no idea how to take on something like the criminal justice system. You know, mothers can't bear to admit, yeah, my son's, my son's in jail. So they say, oh yeah, I haven't seen him for a while. He must be staying with his daddy. I think the most meaningful experience that we have is to get families involved in the lives of their loved ones incarcerated. We've got to begin to admit out loud um, what's happening in our communities and recognize that all of us are criminals. All of us are criminals. There's not one of us who has not violated the law at some moment in our lives. I stole my Nana's TV. See, when you confess your sins, can't nobody talk about me because I already told them. And I'm free. Most Americans have violated drug laws in their lifetime. Barack Obama has admitted to violating our nation's drug laws over and over again. And if he had been arrested and treated like, you know, an ordinary, you know, criminal, if he hadn't been insulated um, by growing up in Hawaii and attending predominantly white universities, more likely than not, he'd be branded a felon cycling in and out of prison with the rest of them. Seeing that our position here in this country, black people, is a situation of inequality no matter what the propaganda says, we're still on the bottom. Everything stands on our shoulders. Um, in the words of H.R. Haldeman, uh, President Richard Nixon's former chief of staff, he said, quote, the whole problem is really the blacks. The key is to devise a system that recognizes this while not appearing to, end quote. I spoke with some youth the other day and I asked them, uh, how many of you know somebody that's incarcerated? 
It was over 90 percent. It has taken away a lot of the young African-American population from, from the communities. I say, how many of you have a family member that's incarcerated? Again, over 90 percent. Sentencing Project in Washington, D.C. has done a number of studies. Uh, one in four African-Americans in their 20s are subject to some kind of supervision from the criminal justice system, uh, on and on. In fact, in the United States today, there are more African-Americans under correctional control, in prison or jail, on probation or parole, than were enslaved in 1850, a decade before the Civil War began. That's the scale of mass incarceration in the African-American community today. We have this sense that black men have just disappeared, when in reality, um, they've been rounded up and disappeared. Um, they could be found in our prisons and jails. They can be found hunting for work. In the drug war, you know, people of color are targeted at such a grossly disproportionate rate that in some states, 80 to 90 percent of all drug offenders sent to prison have been African Americans. Now, this is just astounding given the fact that for decades now, the studies have consistently shown that people of color aren't any more likely to use or sell illegal drugs than whites. Um, you know, our stereotype of a drug dealer is a black kid standing on a street corner with his pants hanging down. And plenty of drug dealing happens in the ghetto, but it happens everywhere else in America as well. Um, drug markets, like much of American society, is fairly segregated by race. Whites tend to sell to whites, blacks tend to sell to blacks, university students sell to each other. But because the drug war has been waged almost exclusively in poor communities of color, we now have um, our prisons overflowing with black and brown drug offenders. Uh, I was incarcerated June 16, 2009, and I did a little time at uh, CFCF before they switched me to the House of Corrections, where I sat there for about four months. They give you three hours for somebody to uh, pay your bail, and after the three hours, they uh, ship you to uh, CFCF. And then after your name is called, after you're done waiting for a period of time, you're supposed to give up all the things that, uh, A, your personal effects, and B, uh, you know, the other ideas that whatever can be used as a weapon. Uh, so your things are your keys, your wallet, your belt. Uh, then you move into another holding cell where you're searched. Uh, there's a special chair that inmates are supposed to sit in to detect if anything is inside their anus. Uh, and then you move on to another holding cell where you take a medical examination. Uh, and then from there you move on to a shower. The last shower you'll take uh, by yourself where you're given a small piece of soap. Uh, you take your shower, and then from there you moved on to a holding cell until you moved into, I guess, what might be re called your permanent cell. That's that's the whole process of them giving you your orange jumpsuits and your toothbrush and stuff like that, taking your blood or blood test. The Philadelphia prison system is actually composed of a number of different small prisons and jails, or some of them are not so small, but it's it composed of a number of different prisons. And they vary in terms of the physical structures. Some of them are newer, but some of them are very old. The holding cell could be at the, was the once defunct Holmesburg prison, which is now the not defunct Holmesburg prison.
as the as the inmate population began to grow and escalate, um, you know, we started double and triple selling. In fact, I had one of my commissioners said to me that there's not a flat surface that, out here that we don't have somebody sleeping on. I mean, people sleeping in gymnasiums and hallways. Uh, I mean, we always try to do the very best we can, and um, but it's just really very, very tough. And we, of course, were sued, uh, and we went through a whole legal battle about all of it, and, and we hired people from Temple University. It was my impression that uh, we finished our work toward the end of one mayoral uh, administration and that uh, the city was interested in uh, settling the suit and did so and uh, that uh, probably very little of the policy change that was recommended then was put into place. Back walls where the beds are like nailed up, you might as well say. And they got two little foam cots on it where you put your sheet and you know your blanket and stuff. You don't get no pillows. And then on the left side of the wall on the floor, that's where the blue boat is uh, sitting at for the third party to uh, lay down. Then, like when you first come in to the cell, the, the toilet is right there that in the sink and that's basically how it looks. Yeah, with a lot of people that was with a lot of people that was locked up with me. Just just about everybody. Like nobody really was sitting in there and like already got convicted, like everybody's waiting for trial. There have been several generations of jail crises here. Uh, bail and pretrial detention decision making has always been a big part of that. When I first received my bail, it was $10,000 and you had to pay 10% and make sure the $1,000 to get out and didn't have it at the time. Each month, I try to get a uh, bail reduction, but I was always denied. I was incarcerated June 16th. I finally seen the judge October 5th at a uh, criminal justice center, and like she herself said, it was ridiculous. I'm sitting in here on that $10,000 bail, so she lowered my bail from $10,000 to $1,000, and that's $100 to 10 percent. So. That's how I got out, and I got out October 7th. I think it's absolutely essential that when we talk about prison overcrowding in the Philadelphia prison system, we remember the context of this overcrowding, that the largest portion of people who are subjected to these conditions have been merely accused of a crime, have not been found guilty of anything by a judge or jury. When we think about the fact that these are the people who are being subjected to the conditions that we've talked about, that is a serious, serious concern. In the House of Corrections, it's like a mouse party. It's just, even when, even when you on the block, like, you would figure like, all right, when they lock us down, you would see mice running around. You could be on the block doing whatever you're doing, and you might see two or three mice run past you, run from this uh, vent to the next vent. It's, it's, it's filthy. Broaches everywhere, like, I, not to my knowledge, I never heard nobody say that, like in the kitchen area, 
it was like that. But I figured if it's like that on the block, you know what the kitchen look like. <laughs> I mean, when you're sleeping in the blue bucket, that's 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 automatic. You 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 gotta worry about if uh, rodents might crawl on you or or anything like that. I mean, your floor level, so that's where everything be at. Well, honestly, when I started in the prison system, it was an attitude that I was better than they were. Um, everybody that came to jail was, deserved to be in jail. Uh, I, I was there to maintain them, to control them, and keep them, uh, keep them directed to the prison establishment. When you got three people in a cell, sometimes up to four people, people that don't know each other, and they're put there because the jail is crowded and they, got to, and they don't have no space. And nobody's being released. Well, there's a uh, legal definition, um, a, a working definition, as they say in Philadelphia, and um, uh, a common sense definition. Uh, double selling's bad enough, triple selling's um, uh, outrageous. When you don't have enough space for the individuals who are being sent there to house them in a humane condition. And so I guess that would be my definition of overcrowding. Well, I suppose if you look at the raw numbers, uh, one might conclude that Philadelphia prisons are overcrowded. Uh, I don't really have a good perspective as to what, how one determines overcrowding. Is it just based on sheer numbers? Is it based on the number of individuals who are sharing cells or how many people are in the cell? Uh, when you talk about overcrowding, it's looking at all the various components of the prison system alone and in combination to determine whether or not the minimal uh, civilized measures of society are being met. That the Philadelphia prison system has been uh, found to be overcrowded by the federal courts pretty much almost constantly since the late 70s. More people graduate from the Philadelphia prisons in some neighborhoods than graduate from high school. The Philadelphia prisons turns out to be an institution that reaches almost every neighborhood and every family. It shouldn't be like that. And why is that? Well, since we've relied so much on a punitive response to social problems in criminal justice, people go to prison, and guess what? Now they're back. They're back in the same communities, only it's a worse time. Well, a person who's been convicted of a felony actually enters into a parallel social universe. Once you have that F label, um, you're relegated to a permanent second-class status for life. You may be denied the right to vote. You are deemed ineligible for jury service for the rest of your life. And you can be legally discriminated against in employment, housing, access to education, public benefits. So many of the old forms of discrimination that we supposedly left behind during the Jim Crow era are suddenly legal again once you've been branded a felon. These men are part of a growing undercast, not class, cast, a group of people defined largely by race who are locked in a permanent second class status uh, for the rest of their lives. You know, people think that, you know, uh, the system, which appears colorblind on the surface, must be colorblind in effect because there's no laws uh, requiring people of different races to be treated differently. Um, 
Well, the reason that a seemingly colorblind system can produce these extraordinary racial disparities is because of discretion. Um, police and prosecutors have extraordinary discretion about who should be stopped, who should be searched, who should be arrested, who should be uh, charged and with what kind of offense, and what kind of plea deal should be offered, who should be given a break, who should be cut loose. Just incredible discretion, nearly unbridled discretion that police and prosecutors have. I think that most judges don't let it impact what they do in terms of sentencing and that they truly look at the individual, they look at the crime, they look at the sentencing guidelines and they give an appropriate sentence despite whatever their feelings may be about prison overcrowding. I think there are many uh, programs that we have designed here on the criminal side that are meant to look at uh, prison overcrowding. No, not everybody that commits a crime has to, needs to be in jail. There are other mechanisms for dealing with the punishment, the retribution, the rehabilitation. And so some programs are designed specifically to get people out of prison or to not let them enter the prison doors at all. And judges are very aware of those programs. And if they are appropriate uh, candidates for those programs, they will forward those individuals to those as well. In exercising this discretion and making decisions about who seems like a good kid, who deserves another chance, and who seems like you know, a hardened criminal or someone who can't seem to learn a lesson or poses a risk to society, in making those incredibly subjective determinations both conscious and unconscious biases and stereotypes inevitably affect decision making. Would you close your eyes for a second and envision a drug user and describe that person to me? You know, we all have racial biases and stereotypes. You can't live in our society today and not have some racial biases and stereotypes um, about you know, who the likely criminals are and who's more likely to be involved in drug dealing or sales or who's more likely to be violent. Our media is saturated with this, these images. You know, our culture has been saturated with them. And police and prosecutors are not immune like the rest of us. They have these conscious as well as unconscious stereotypes, and they do uh, infect decision-making at every stage of the criminal justice process. Um, study after study uh, that has been done over the last 20 or 30 years has shown that police and prosecutors exercise their discretion in racially discriminatory ways um, that have truly disastrous consequences. Generally, uh, two-thirds recidivate uh, of the average inmate. Why is that the case? Is that what we want? People to go in prison, become more violent, come out, commit more crime. Let's look at our, let, let's, let, let's look at prisons overall and, and look at the role that prisons play in society and ask, what are they doing and how are they set up? Because if you look at our prisons now, there's no education by and large that's just driven out of all the prisons, okay? So people go into prison and what do they get? They get trained to become more violent. But programs have been successful in reducing uh, this. In Philadelphia, uh, part of the fine money from the Jackson case was used to fund a program called the Jobs Program. And after two years, they had a recidivism rate in the teens. But the money ran out and the city decided not to uh, pick up once our money was exhausted and the city decided to go in a different direction which was tax incentives to employers who hire ex-offenders. Sadly, not one employer has taken up uh, uh, the opportunity to hire an ex-offender and get a tax credit. And the program's now about two years old. So uh, we had a program that we felt was working. It was a hands-on program uh, where there was direct uh, uh, supervision and intervention uh, by social workers and, and trained professionals, and it seemed to be working well, but it was discontinued.
we all talk about reentry. That's coming back. If we could figure out reentry, then we can figure out pre-entry, which means let's do the things that we that we now are beginning to talk about to integrate offenders who have gone through the system. Let's bring those issues to bear to communities and get those folks not to go into the system in the first place. There's a lack of real skills in the black community and maybe in some of the other poor communities, a lack of skills, inadequate education. If they had more programs in the prison, you know, you have people doing something rather than just sitting around playing cards and stuff, I mean, people come out and turn out better, you know, because, I mean, they had something to look forward to rather than just sitting around and just guessing what they're going to look forward to when they get out. There was a period when rehabilitation was the word, and that was the 70s and the 80s. But the overcrowding just overwhelmed the ability to re rehabilitate. And in my opinion, the 90s and into the, the 21st century have largely been about warehousing. If we were to go back to the rates of incarceration that we had in the 1970s, you know, a time when many civil rights activists thought that rates of incarceration were just egregiously high, but if we were to go back to the bad old days of the 1970s, we'd have to release four out of five people who are in prison today. More than a million people employed by the criminal justice system could lose their jobs. They're set, set way out in the suburbs, so that gives jobs to people in the suburbs. Building the prison gives jobs to the construction company, et cetera, et cetera. It just keeps magnifying. And then, of course, you have to have the prisoners who once again are poor folks, black folks, Hispanics, et cetera. You know, prisons across America would have to close and shut down. You know, we're not going to get there without a major fight. So that's why I say nothing short of a major social movement has any hope of ending this system. At the state level, the more we spend on prisons, the less we have for secondary education. I mean, that's just obvious in the state budget. But somehow, if we don't start dealing with neighborhoods in trouble, um, which involves a whole lot of things that aren't criminal justice. Um, criminal justice is the social service institution of last resort, not by its choice. Um, we have neighborhoods that reflect um, the breakdown of community health systems, community mental health systems, school systems, uh, and a lack of uh, economic opportunity. You know, back in the 1950s, you know, areas that we think of as ghettos today, most of them were actually doing quite well. Um, you know, those communities may have been suffering a high level of discrimination and racial segregation, but at least the people who lived there had jobs because factories uh, were typically located in those urban communities so those businesses would have quick access to cheap labor. Well, today those factories are gone. They've vanished. Um, you know, in a very short period of time, Due to deindustrialization and globalization, those factories have closed down, those jobs have been shipped overseas. Hundreds of thousands of people found themselves jobless and stranded in these segregated ghetto communities. Well, we could have responded to that crisis with a wave of compassion and caring, with economic stimulus packages, bailout plans, you know. We could have responded with a wave of compassion and caring, but instead, we declared the war on drugs. Again, if, you know, if you're not able to create jobs for people and, and put people back to work and be responsible, then the drug problem is going to exist. You know what I mean? And it's not going to change. So it's like a rolling ball. We just keep rolling and rolling and it gets bigger and bigger. So we need to let the, let the politicians know that you, know, you can't keep doing this. You have to come up with some kind of plan or try to start working with programs that's, that's really feasible working and make programs be accountable for what they're doing. I also think our, our, we have to take a look at our sentencing practices. You know, we went through this period of time, I guess, in the 90s when we had these mandatory sentences and, you know, it was three strikes and you're out. And we were giving people really, really very long sentences. Um, and 
and, and it's, it's not a deterrent. And it's not working. Crime is still really, really high. We know that. And I think for the politicians, like for the Democrats and the Republicans, basically I think that they can come out and try and pose as tough on crime and say, we care about safety, so I'm going to make sure these streets are cleaned up and, and argue for more uh, cops and say that we, you know, that they care about safety and never really get into what I, what I like to say is, um, you know, the causes of crime. Let's get into what really is going to uh, make things more safe. And unfortunately, they're all the things that, that uh, we see our president cutting. You know, things that are, you know, better substance abuse programs. You know, things that really will matter. And the, if, if people live in desperate circumstances, then desperate acts take place. A system that has to be changed up dramatically. Factually, is actually one of the worst ways of not acting democratically. It's torture and solitary. Prisoner abuse is not very conducive to solutions. It's quite the contrary. It's way too overcrowded. But do they care? I doubt it. Because it's not about logic. It's that they pocket in the profit in because you're actually nothing. All you are is something locked in a cage back and forth every day. We're going to need to see a new civil rights type movement. We're going to need to see more and more people joining together to challenge some of these institutions. afford to lose our voice in this, not in our city that has one of the highest youth incarceration rates in the country, not in our city that has one of the lowest, one of the lowest college going rates in the country. We cannot afford it, not for our youth, not as the push out rate skyrockets and the prison system expands. We cannot afford it. Black men are dropping out more and more every day. There's an achievement gap between Caucasian students and black students, not only in North Carolina, not only in Philadelphia, not only in Maryland, but all over the country. Now, either you believe God gave us less brains, or we got a sick system that's not educating our children. We need a movement. Yeah. I find many people say, well, why don't we just file a big class action lawsuit to address racial bias in the criminal justice system? What people don't realize is that the U.S. Supreme Court has closed the courthouse doors to claims of racial bias at every stage of the criminal justice process, from stops and searches to plea bargaining and sentencing. For all practical purposes, race discrimination in the criminal justice system is perfectly legal so long as no one admits it. That's the key. In a series of cases beginning with McCleskey versus Kemp and Armstrong versus United States, the U.S. Supreme Court has ruled that no matter how compelling uh, the statistical evidence may be, no matter how severe the racial disparities might be, unless you can offer proof of conscious intentional bias, you know, tantamount to an admission, you can't even get in the courthouse door. We're not going to allow this to take place anymore, and we're going to figure out a way to fight back. And that's not always exactly clear about how to exactly do that, but we have to take on both our politicians and the courts, that we have to challenge the framework that says that, you know, we have to wait for the politicians to grant us our rights or things like that, or we have to wait for the courts to give us a decision. So in this way, the U.S. Supreme Court has made our criminal justice system, you know, off limits, um, you know, to scrutiny for racial bias, much in the same way that the Supreme Court once rallied uh, in support of Jim Crow and slavery in their day. going to end bias in the system or end mass incarceration through a grand litigation strategy. It's going to take a major social movement. It's just not for Alpha now. It's for all 
hard. We know it's going to be resistance. But power concedes nothing without a struggle. Nobody's going to give it to us. We've never gotten anything in this country without a fight. Occupy Philadelphia doing a great thing. They came out and they're addressing all kinds of issues in Philly, New York, Oakland, all over the country. Education, not incarceration, bond 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 education, not greedy corporation, bond education, not greedy corporation. All over the world, people are standing up saying, this is not business as usual. You can bring the cops out here all you want. You can beat, you can do tear gas. It's only making the movement stronger because this is our country. We need a movement in the state of Maryland. $91 million was stated to be taken away. We need a movement. We have more money going into jails than we have going into schools. We need a movement. We have more money going into the war over there in our right instead of going into our schools. Don't underestimate what can happen in these prisons. And it's very, very difficult to organize inside these prisons, extremely difficult, but it can happen. We see it in the drive movement in Texas. We saw it here in Illinois with the death row 10 struggle. And we saw it just recently with the largest prisoner strike ever in US history taking place in Georgia. And what was some of their demands? We want dignity, we want better health care, we want um, training and education in prison. And basically their slogan was, we want dignity. And they were in a lockdown for liberty, as they called it. It was extremely, extremely um, inspiring to those of us that do criminal justice work on the outside to see that kind of a struggle uh, take place. And even though they, ma they were massively repressed because of what they did, um, they got their voice out there and they felt their power and they came together across racial lines, across eth ethnicity, religious lines, and we know what they do in these prisons, that they foster groups and they pit them against each other to fight and not to come together. And this was a brilliant showing of the prisoners coming together and say, we will not be divided. While the Get Tough movement and the war on drugs was born with black folks in mind, it is now destroyed um, people in communities of all colors. Um, you know, a black kid who's facing 15 years uh, in prison for a relatively minor drug crime, and a white kid in Kansas who's facing a prison sentence rather than drug treatment he needs desperately, are both suffering because of a drug war that was declared uh, in the wake of uh, you know civil rights movement um, with black folks in mind. I think in a very true, just society where people are treated fairly, where there isn't racism, where people can afford to feed their families and have good childcare and things like that, crime will absolutely go down. You're not gonna see those kinds of things. You're not gonna see the need for uh, prisons the way that we have them. But while we do have them, they need to be places that are humane. We need to argue for things like education. One of the things that we know is that when people are educated in prison, they are much less likely to commit crime when they go out, go out of prison. What's the second most important thing we know? A connection to their families. So we need to make it, make sure that they can have access to their family and to things in the community. So it means not building these prisons that are like a gazillion miles from where these families live. Make it affordable that they can call their loved ones. We need your help. We desperately, right now, we need every um, person, even outside of having a loved one in prison. We need your help. We're seeing prison become part of an educational thing here in Philadelphia. That not only are kids being disciplined, they're being sent to the CEP prison school. So if for no other reason you don't want to get involved, get involved, save our youth. Save our youth who are like destined.
nothing short of a major social movement has any hope of ending this system. But I don't think we should become discouraged or overwhelmed by that. You know, there was a time when people thought there would be no way that Jim Crow could ever be brought to its knees. But a major social movement did arise uh, that managed to do precisely that. Well, we've got to do it again. students go inside the Philadelphia prisons but also inside the state prisons and, and play a role in discussions with the inmates and somehow realizing that the people who are there are people like you and me, uh, less fortunate at the moment, uh, and uh, to realize that you know, they're human beings. And so the way to think about helping that situation is to sort of identify the problems that you see. Uh, that are in, involved with people going to prison and staying in prison and when they come out of prisons. begin to embrace those labeled criminals, not necessarily all of their behavior, but them, their humanness. So we've got to open our hearts and our minds and start telling the truth to each other about how this system operates, where it came from, and what it's doing to our communities in the present. And this dialogue can begin in schools, in churches, and in community centers. And once we all begin to wake up, I think a major social movement is far more likely. Let us believe that we can stop money from going into jail across this country. Let us believe that we can threaten any oppressive power structure in this country that is opposing the youth. Let us believe, let us believe that we can bring our troops home from the war we had no business going on in the first place. And let us discovered my mother with a needle body blows body sees a shock wave of being and I'm watching the thief rob and plunder I cry and I spin then numbness sets in 
as I rage like the lightning and thunder. Hope, trust, sanctity withers and dies. I deaden inside. Sours my mind. I deaden inside. The feeling I had when I found out my money was on drugs. The day I realized the thief in the night has broken and entered our household. Hope, trust, sacredness. My pilot light dimmed. There was nothing I can do but stew in despair, expressing my feelings in outbursts of defining pain was dwarfed by the feelings the drug possessed. Feeling my life is a mess, but truly contraire, still in despair, I cry. My life is now altered, feeling that all things have faltered. My mom was like my God at that age to me. Has God failed me? Where would I look to now for guidance? An inception of the wearing down a pure heart. Numbness sets in. The sentiment becomes stoicism. Indifference. I rage. Was it the finding out my mother did drugs? Or the acknowledgement that that spark in her eye wasn't because of me anymore. Or for my sake she would not quit and do it anymore. Or that I had to accept the things that she did that hurt me to the core. Like mental body blows that later became my woes. blows, body sees a shockwave of being, and I'm watching the thief rob and plunder. I cry and I spin, then numbness sets in, as I rage like the lightning and thunder. I deaden inside